Today on The Grave Talks, Journey to Conjuring, a conversation with Joe Vitale. Joe Vitale began his life in a comfortable, safe home, a home he loved, until it didn't love him or his family back. What had changed and who had changed it? This became the mystery he would chase. Chase all the way to becoming a professional paranormal investigator and entering the door of the infamous Conjuring House. I lived in a home that had uh, some pretty um, dark activity. A lot of it was uh, more uh, psychological. Okay. I was actually terrified. I wanted nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a family member, my grandmother, just very religious. Nothing wrong with that, but everything was the devil. Ghosts don't exist. It's always the devil. Mm -hmm. So at a very young age, that's what I believed. You know, oh, you know, it's the devil. It's the devil. Sure. Um, So, you know, I was, of course, terrified because all I was hearing, you know, was, oh, the devil can do this. Mm -hmm. The devil can do that. But there was never that, hey, but on the other side of the coin, here's, you know, here's God. And here's what he can do. No, no, didn't really hear that. It was always the the negative uh, side. Sure. Um, And I guess perhaps maybe she was trying to scare me uh, to get me to go to church. Okay. (laughs) I don't know, but. (laughs) Passive aggressive way of doing it, but sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, So. We dealt with that for a few years, uh, finally got rid of it. Like I said, a lot of it was psychological. It was mm-hmm. more in your head rather than uh, physical. I mean, there were some physical yeah. things that had happened. My father, he was attacked. Uh, he was sleeping. He got pinned down. Uh, something was choking him, uh, biting both of his wrists and his feet. Mm-hmm. And he actually did have marks. He kind of kept that quiet for a while. That was a conversation that I ended up overhearing. Mm -hmm. So that has happened. We've had things moved and we've had like mimicking going on. Uh, Mm -hmm. My stepmom, a lot of times she wouldn't even stay in the house by herself. Uh, She'd just sit outside, wait for somebody to come home. She'd swear, you know, me or my brothers or or my sister, we were in the house, you know, calling for her. Yeah. Um, Most recently in the house, no, before I get to that there real quick, I want to back it up. We did have somebody come to the house three times. Uh, the third time was a charm, but there's always still something there. Yeah. Most recent thing, which was a few years ago, my son and I, we were at the house. And my son, he was just playing his video games. And um, I was just doing some stuff in the bedroom. Uh, and we were just kind of hanging around. I was doing laundry. And we heard my stepmom say, Joey, and I, you know, my son looked at me. I looked at him. I'm like, you hear that? And he's like, yeah. I said, who did that sound like? He's like, Grandma. I'm like, yeah. She's not here. He's like, yeah, I know. And then whatever, no big deal. Just went back to doing what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so about a couple of years after we had somebody come in and get rid of whatever was in the house. I was with a friend of mine and we were at a, a restaurant and we're just teenagers. And apparently at that point in time, going to this specific restaurant and sitting around and drinking coffee was like the cool thing to do, you know, make you feel like you're an adult or whatever. But a friend and I, we were sitting in a booth and my buddy, he was just kind of making fun of me about the stuff that was going on in the house. Now he wasn't being serious. He was just, you know, kind of poking fun at it. So he got up, up and, uh, went to go use the restroom on his way to the restroom ran into some other friends. So he started talking to them. Well, somebody from the bit behind us got up, come over to me, started asking me questions. I'm like, who are you? Like, I don't want anything to do with you. Mm-hmm. Like, it was so bizarre. Yeah. And he said, he said, well, you know, we want to know more about it. He's like, maybe, you know, we could take you with us, you know, uh, to a place that we deem, you know, is safe for you. And, you know, you kind of get to see, you know, what we do, what it's about. And we can just, you know, get information from you, you know, learn more about it. Yeah. I turned it down. I turned it down. I was terrified. I'm like, dude, this guy. I'm <laughs> sure. like, 
13 years old, and this guy, he's in his 20s. Other people who were sitting in that booth, they were older than he was. Sure. I'm like, what is this guy doing? Like, you know, what's like, could he get kidnapped or something here? What's going on? Yeah. So I declined. He was somewhat persistent about it. He gave up. Two weeks later, I ran into him at a gas station. I was with my dad. He's like, hey, you remember me? And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> it's this guy. Mm-hmm. You know, he w- he was a little more pushy this time around. I'm like, all right, whatever. I gave him the house number, thinking I would never hear from them. And I don't know, a few days later, my dad says, Joe, you got a phone call. It's some guy. I'm like, okay. And it was him. It was Bill saying, hey, we're going to go to this place, and it's pretty safe. We're just going there for uh, whatever reason that one he, he had told me. And I'm like, all right. Told them where I lived. And then I'm like, wait a minute. What am I going to tell my parents? <laughs> I was <laughs> like, um, I, I'm going to go spend the night at a friend's house this weekend. <laughs> yeah, that I don't know so. that uh, approached me at a restaurant. <laughs> Never mind what we've been seeing on Dateline. That's not, that doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So I've taken a risk, but sure. um, obviously it turned out fine. Um, and I went on that one, and then a couple more, and then pretty soon it just kind of found my way onto their team. Yeah. And I was on the team for quite some time. I was 14 years old or something. Wow. And and looking back on it, I realized what they had done. You know. Apparently they they seen something in me and they thought that I'd be a good investigator. Mm-hmm. Um, so they slowly eased me into it by training me without directly really training me and learning. It's almost like Amway but ghosts. Yeah. So it, it was. Yeah. So it was, it was just. It was just. It was just really weird. Sure. You know how they did that, and and I never thought about it until. Um, many years later, and then I had talked to uh, uh, Bill, and I said, you know what I realized you guys did? And I told him, he's like, yeah, it's exactly what we did. Yeah. He's like, yeah, turned out well for you, didn't it? <laughs> I said, well, that's debatable, but... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think there's something, especially within the community of folks who are out there investigating. I, I, I do not investigate. I just sit here behind my microphone and talk to everybody that does. Uh, and then I can kind of like connect stories together. But um, th- there is certainly something there with certain folks that I'm sure you're aware, you know, just the, the sensitivity level that some people have and the empathic abilities that some people have. Where they just know, you know, they, they all the way to the point of just walking up to people at airports going, I know something about a family member of yours. Let me tell you this. Um, and it's strange as hell, but it's usually accurate right. and they're doing it. Um, you know, I, I would b- believe the same thing would be happening too of of folks who, you know, have that ability could also sense this person or that person likely has some some abilities and some gifts in this area maybe they're not presenting themselves as we sit here at denny's but i just know that it's there and and that's understandable for the the world that we're talking about let me ask you this before we keep going other than your grandmother constantly saying it's the devil it's the devil i get that i understand it i had a grandmother who kind of always went down the dark path of everything too and it was like ma grandma it's not always you know like that um but Right. How, how did you personally get the feeling or vibe that there was something in that house that was dark? And when you look back on it, would you call it not necessarily the devil, and but the word that gets thrown around obviously far too much, demonic, when you look back on the experiences that were had there? Um, looking back on it, I certainly would say it was something dark. I'm not going to say it was demonic. I'm not okay. going to say it's the devil. Sure. I don't know. I was too young. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you're only being, you're only, you only know what you're being told. Sure. When it, when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my grandparents actually lived in that house. They didn't die in that house. The house wasn't built on a cemetery. Mm-hmm. And this house was in Southeast Michigan. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's just a neighborhood, you know? Yeah. So my grand my grandfather he had that house built. It was a custom home. He did the brickwork on it. Now, 
have an uncle who was adopted who got into some pretty bad things. We believe that's that's how it got into the house. That he he invited okay whatever it was into the home. What was he involved um, in that you believe it got invited in through? He was he he was heavily into music, but he he also had uh, he was mentally ill. Okay, and yeah, he was a musician. He wanted to be a great guitar player. He you know idolized a lot of guitar players, and he wanted to be just as good as they were. He wanted to be famous. Sure. Um, and the story is is you know he because he thought. Some people, you know, within the music industry made a deal with the devil. That's what he thought he could do. Okay. So, you know, and again, this is just secondhand information. Yeah. Um, but my, my grandparents, they moved out. Um, my aunt and my uncle, they ended up moving into the house. Uh, the uncle who um, invited whatever that entity was into the house, he stayed behind. And they had some experiences there, too. Now, my uncle Joe, um, he's always, he, he's very, like, outgoing. Like, he's very loud, like, no filter, and he's always saying something, and it's just, when you, when you think he can't shock you, <laughs> <laughs> he says something else <laughs> that's like, what, did he just say that? Yeah. Um, but he kept saying, there is something in the house, there is something in the house, there's something going on. And we were just like, okay, you know, whatever. Well, my parents were anyways. We just kind of like, okay, Joe, uh, whatever. So they um, they ended up putting uh, this particular uncle um, into a group home. He was just, it was getting to a point where they felt unsafe. Yeah. So they uh, went, they got all his stuff, you know, they moved it out. And they knew that he hung out in the attic quite a bit so they went up to the attic to check out what was there and they found like these weird drawings they found these uh occult books and some other stuff and then they found knives uh up there and they had my grandparents his mother and father's name on them along with my aunt and uncle's name on them mm -hmm. and they're like okay what was he gonna do yeah and that that's you know that scared the hell out of me. sure get the hell out of anybody so that's that's the story we heard from them. Then we move in. Well, there were some other people who moved, in, moved into the home. They didn't last but six months um, for whatever reason. Then we moved in. But I always thought that there was something there. Something something always seemed a little weird in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moving in there, you know, um, never feeling alone and just having things happen, such as knocks and hearing people in the home who are not in the home. Just a lot of really weird things. Um, so I was never comfortable. And I always wondered why, because we never talked about it. Mm -hmm. And I could never understand, like, why did, why did my stepmom want somebody around her all the time? Yeah. Uh, my stepmother, she was building a dollhouse. It's this big, this dollhouse was ridiculous. It was but she wanted somebody, you know, with her. She was building it in the basement. And she wanted somebody with her at all times. She did not want to be left alone. I could never understand why until, you know. Yeah. We, we all just like, we're finally like, uh, there's something going on. Yeah. Uh, when you look back on, on the whole situation, do you feel like when you visited, before you guys had actually taken up residence there, when your uncle was there, um, before he was taken to a facility for, for treatment. Did, was the energy worse? Did, like, w w were things just kind of darker when he was around as opposed to when he was, was no longer uh, re residing there? It always, it always felt the same. Okay. Um, and I, and this is going to sound horrible of me to say, but I did not feel comfortable around him. Sure, but there's nothing wrong with that. That I mean, obviously, right, yeah. you know, you, there's there's good reason. <laughs> You're using right, your reasoning yeah. skills. Good job. More people need to do that. <laughs> yeah, but, I did not feel. Yeah, I just did not feel comfortable. Sure, at all. I mean, he, you know, my perception of him when I was a child was, this is this guy is 
this is the crazy uncle. Yeah. Like this is like the legit med sounds horrible of me to say. I mean, he's doing far better now. Yeah. But sure. You no. Know, well, like, it, it, and, and get that, away from me. And, and that's an understandable thing, especially when he has like knives and things and people's names on them. Um, that would, that would lead one to be a little uh, suspicious. <laughs> As to what one's intent is, uh, you know, but, oh, they, but but then you you go back a, a, a step deeper and you go, OK, well, this person is suffering from something. There's a mental illness going on here. And then you have right. that's where the compassion comes in. And that's where you can understand that. Unfortunately, uh, obviously, what what I'm sure you've seen, what what I've seen over the years is is fairly similar um, when someone is is suffering from a mental illness, um, uh, no matter what it is. Uh, I've seen almost everything now. Uh quite often that it, it is either an attractant uh, or it kind of opens a door sometimes for other crap to pile onto that individual uh, that is not necessarily connected to the mental illness, but will also not be recognized as anyone in the outside world as being something other than the mental illness um, where they can get, you know, they're obviously already sick and they need help. But when you get to the demonic stuff or the darker stuff, um, it's like, gosh, this stuff, it, it, it's, it's attached on. This is beyond just what they're, you know, c- coming up with themselves chemically with their bodies and what their minds are producing. They're being tortured by something else. Uh, do you believe right. that that was the case with your uncle for a while, that there was not only just the mental illness going on, but there was in combination in conjunction with that something, some spirits, something dark, whatever it was. Um, we don't have to define it as being demonic. It could just have been a real asshole ghost um, that was right. using him more so as a battery or as a catalyst to to, to attach itself to. I love that question. Um, I do believe that when somebody had when somebody and I don't want people to think that, you know, having a mental illness is some sort of horrible stigma. No. Um, you know, we're, everybody has. Everybody has something going on with them. Definitely. Uh, we're, we're not perfect. Yeah. Uh, so with him, I believe that was the case. Uh, and, and, you know, again, just observing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, I was not a paranormal investigator. But looking back on it, I can, you know, I say in my opinion, I believe that that was happening to him. Yeah. Um, when we lived in the home, sometimes he would come over, just out of nowhere, just come over and visit. Yeah. And it's just you know, like, it's only just my stepmother and I. And we're having a con, like, well, I, I guess technically we were. But he would just turn his head and, and look over and start talking to somebody. Yeah. Now, we didn't have the house. At that point in time, the house wasn't... Um, wasn't blessed or, or it wasn't cleansed or anything like that at that point in time. So my stepmom, I remember this. I'll never forget this. My stepmother looked over at him and said, Frankie, who are you talking to? And he turned and looked at her and he said, a friend, but you can't see him. Only I can. Mm-hmm. And we're just like, Ooh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, he's done that several times where people just walk away and talk to nobody. And we're like, who are you talking to? Mm-hmm. And it was, it was always, you can't see this person. Only I can. And we're just like, okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's, the, that's now, the difficult thing with that. When, it, when you, when you think you may have a, a, a combination of the two going on, on our side of things, unless you're that individual, you know, and even then, you know, if they're already not in a good mental state, they can't determine what is something that, you know, their mind is producing or what is an external force that is is screwing with them. And that's it's almost like it it just it it preys or sometimes these dark things just prey on individuals um, where they where they see that as a weakness, and and that's that's the sad, scary part of all of that. Because there's obviously mental illness, and there's just flat out mental illness. It's nothing to do with ghosts or demonic or anything at all. And 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 that, and there's variants of it. And you know, you want to get treatment, you want to get help, and be the best version of yourself that you can be. And that's what you know most right, loved yeah. ones would want for somebody. But sometimes too, I I believe after so many years of doing these shows and and so many stories, 
sometimes you have the two in conjunction with one another and, and just, it it torments people and it's horrible. That's why I'm I'm curious because, you know, is to understand that, that full spectrum of the story. When you look at everything back at that house, um, what do you, what, what comes to your mind? You're an investigator now. Did you ever do any sort of formal esque investigation or research on the house or the property to try and get any answers as to what it is or was that's there? Um, or has it just kind of been a mystery for you? Um, I've done some research. I haven't like done a, a, a proper investigation on the house. Um, but I have looked into like the history of, of the property and the entire subdivision. Mm-hmm. And I can't find anything. Like there's just nothing there. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I believe that. Mm-hmm. And even just just looking back at like what was found, yeah, it was invited in. It, it was yeah, it was invited in. Yeah. Uh, so. No. Yeah. Ver- so so that, funny, so the, that that's where you come from. Go go ahead, continue on. You no, know, so funny thing was is now many years later, uh, I'm no longer living in the house. I'm off on my own, mm-hmm. and I come over to visit. It's just my uh, my uh, stepbrother and his friend that were at at the house at the time and my stepbrother well his buddy said he's like dude you won't believe this what he's like todd and i we went to go in the attic to see if there was anything left behind uh, from your uncle i'm like okay i'm thinking they found something in the attic Mm -hmm. he's like as soon as todd opened the attic door the phone rang which scared the hell out of him well Todd went to go answer the phone. He's, and it was our uncle Frankie. And, and I'm like, okay, that's just strange. He's like, dude, it gets even weirder. I'm like, oh, how? He said, your uncle asked, has anybody been in the attic lately? <laughs> and that's that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, no way. And he was like, no, I am serious. Yeah. I asked my stepbrother about that. He's like, yeah, dude. He's like, I'm never again. <laughs> it's like there's never some. Never again am I going to try to go up there. <laughs> it's like there, there's something that's still there attached with the house and attached with him that seems to be able to communicate. I, I want to talk yeah. about, um, obviously we know you're an investigator. We know some more of your, your backstory of, of what brought you, what inspired you to, to find an interest in this. Uh, and very understandably, um, you, you're working on uh, a documentary that's about to come out about the Harrisville haunting, educate our audience, educate our listeners about the Harrisville haunting and, and the case itself and, and give us some background there. All right, so the Harrisville haunting, the house itself. Um, if everybody's familiar with the movie The Conjuring, mm-hmm. um, we actually went to the real location. Yep. Uh, the movie studio they actually wanted to film The Conjuring at the original house, mm-hmm. but they couldn't get the permits or anything like that to get in there. Uh, I guess there, it was deemed as not having enough space. Mm-hmm. So they ended up having to build a set, build a house, and shoot at a different location. So everybody knows Ed and Lorraine Warren, they were involved uh, with that house, with the parents. Um, it was actually Keith and Carl Johnson who were the first to come out there and actually investigate. Really, and then they brought yep. Then they brought on Ed and Lorraine Warren, and Keith and his brother Carl. They were just kind of pushed to the side a little bit, uh, and of course, and no disrespect to the Warrens. I have a lot of respect for them. I know there's a lot of controversy with them, but with anything, there's always going to be some sort of uh, sure. Controversy. But uh, they just kind of made an, um, a name for that house and, mm-hmm. and the parents. And again, not, not taking a shot at anyone. You know, we've done interviews with uh, a family member uh, of the parents. She's Andrea, yep. actually. I know Andrea. She's a, yeah, she's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's really, really sweet. 
Uh, she was more than willing to uh, do an interview with, uh, with actually Matt Benton uh, for The Conjuring House. Uh, they did that uh, through the magical uh, world of the internet. Um, so Ed had believed that whatever was in the house uh, was too powerful and there was really nothing uh, anyone could do about it. Uh, whereas it was either Keith or Carl said that he just has a different opinion on that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that it's not like, it's not like hidden. You know, most people probably know after the parents had moved out, another lady and, and her husband, they had bought the house and claimed that there were no incidences. Everything was made up. Um, you know, just basically saying it was all, it was fake and uh, fraudulent yeah. and stuff like that. Sure. But then over the past few years, her stories changed where, oh yeah, we have experienced this. We have experienced that. So it's like, well, which is it? Mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, did you or didn't you? We did not interview her. We thought it was best uh, not to invest, or I'm, I'm sorry, we thought it was best not to interview her because what she said before and what she's saying now, it, it just, it doesn't look good on, on her. And I, I don't know the lady. Uh, I, I know she's friends with uh, Andrea, mm -hmm. but we just thought better just stay away from from that and we'll stick to this. Um, there was never the story about uh, uh, the Shiva being a witch was not true. Sure. Uh, um, I'm not really sure how all of that came together and, and turned into a story where everybody was thinking it was fact. Um, everybody's very transparent and open about that story. And how mm -hmm. She was just not a witch. Um, I don't want to give away too much, but um, <clears throat> is, a, is the house haunted? Absolutely. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that you're going to walk in there and it's going to it's going to go crazy. That's just simply not how how that house works. Mm -hmm. um, it's it it will catch you off guard, and that's what happened to us throughout the two days that we were there. Things happened that caught us off guard. One of the things that was not captured. I'll go ahead and I will talk about this because I did talk about it after it happened. Okay. I was coming out of the bathroom and I heard this little girl like question, like asking a question like daddy. And I thought, okay. Now I thought Bill may have been on the phone with his daughter because he was talking to his daughter while we were there. He was helping her with her homework. Everybody was outside. I was the only one in, in the house. So I was kind of confused. And as I come out into the kitchen, the rest of the guys can walk in and I'm like, did you guys hear that? And I'm like, no, what? Um, I told them what had happened. Mm -hmm. And it was just very strange. Things like that happened to each of us at that house. Um, it was very, it was very weird. Uh, a lot of that stuff caught us off guard. A lot of it happened when we weren't filming, and we try to keep our cameras go going at all times. But there, you know, you come to a point where we got to stop filming, we got to charge our batteries, we got to take what's on our SD cards, put them on another drive. That stuff just it just takes time. Sure. So. While that's going on, we're like, hey, this happened. 
<laughs> and we, we we don't have anything going to to back that up. It yeah. just becomes a story. So a lot of mimicking happens in that house. Um, and we 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 caught some pretty cool stuff. So in this documentary, you have Matt Benton from Devil's Hours Production. You have Billy Cook. He's from PSPR uh, or Paranormal Pursuit. Eric Connor from Epic Paranormal. You know, we just got together and all of us, we all believe a little different than one another. We all investigate a little different than one another. And we just wanted to take all of that and just like throw it into a pot and, you know, see what happens. Sure. You always, you always see on social media, oh, well, these people use this equipment and it's garbage or people will swear by the equipment that they're using that it works and they're, they're getting communication or, or evidence. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of like that back and forth, you know, they're doing it wrong. Yeah. No, you're doing it wrong. No, you don't understand this. And it's kind of that back and forth. We're just like, why don't we just put it all together? Yeah. Rather than yeah, battling and, and, of who, who's who's doing it best, let's just all all do our own thing and just respect that. <laughs> right, we're just you know together. I mean, you know, there, there's things that you know, like Eric Connor that he uses, where I'm just like, eh, I don't know if I buy that. Sure, you know, very skeptical of it. Hey, and Matt, Matt, you know, he would he would agree with me on certain things, but at the same time, we're like, dude, use it. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I mean, you never know, you know. We may get communication. Something may happen. Yeah. So we were, you know, even though being skeptical about it, we were so open and we just want, we want, you know, everybody to be themselves and investigate the way that they would normally do mm -hmm. and, and getting all those different personalities together. Well, let's see what happens. Sure. With Eric Connor. We wanted to bring him in because he is just hyper. I mean, he is just go, 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 go. And we wanted to see if maybe because of that, because of his personality, because of his energy, if that may attract something to him. So it's more about, yeah, it is a documentary on the house. But at the same time, here's four guys, uh, Two of which I, well, I never investigated with Bill Cook. I have investigated with Matt and Eric. Matt has only investigated with me, but not Eric or Bill. So in that too, a lot of things could go wrong. Mm -hmm. Personalities clash, uh, things like that. But you know, we went in there and we did things the way that, you know, we would normally do them and work together. And I think we got some pretty cool stuff out of that. And when, I, I believe, I believe, you know, if we can set aside the whole um, argument of how to and how not to, mm -hmm. and to a certain point, there is a, this is not how sure. you, you investigate. But if we can put a lot of that to the side and just work together, maybe able to come up with some great ideas mm -hmm. um, or come, you know, come walk away with a really great piece of evidence. And so it's, you know, trying to just work with everybody. That wraps up part one of our conversation with Joe Vitale. In part two, we will dive deeper into his investigation of the Conjuring House. We'll ask, who was the little girl that he encountered while investigating? What was the best piece of evidence that Joe and his team walked away with while investigating? Did Joe feel that the energy in the Conjuring House was positive, negative, both? And to the spirits of the Conjuring House or any house that is open for paranormal investigation, do they want to be investigated? Are we invading their space? Or are they happy to have the company? Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening.